Greene County, New York, 1970. Jacob was dreaming of dancing. There were footprints in the rock powdered rosin on the stage floor, and he was 19 again, the only man in that long line of leggy girls, each one fitted with a canary yellow sequined skin, tiny caps of glittering beads from which their curls escaped in riots of promised promiscuity. They spun and kicked, and they passed him from front to back, row by row, girl after girl, until he reached that one face, that perfect, trusting, upturned face. The bed creaked, which woke him. But he woke and moved, and that's what creaked the bed. It was always like that. Jacob woke when he always woke. It creaked as it always creaked, and the moment of each was the same. The same aching shins, too. The same stiffness which made it so much easier to round forward over his knees, to pull on his socks, so much harder to sit back up, to stand and pull up his trousers. His trousers, jeans, were as stiff as his back, heavy blue denim that held his working shape, as if he might forget the farm and try to be something else, wake up one day as the dancer he'd been in that dream of 40 years ago, someone softer. Even if he did wake up transformed and thrust into them the twiggy, brittle legs of a deer, the genes would train them back to the service of the tractor. The tractor would win, but the tractor could wait. First it was breakfast. There were no animals to tend, not since he lost Lenore. When she died, he'd seen the lie in living things. The pony he had given to the neighbor for his kids. The goats had gone feral, not that they're ever truly tame. He saw them from time to time. Everything else had left or died. There had been a lot of death and he hadn't minded it one bit. The stench of rotting rabbits and hens had just assured him that it was all true. Everything he felt when she died. All that lived was just waiting for the rot, the sweep of hairy black mold, the rats and the rot, and it was over. He wept. He still wept often over breakfast in the kitchen full of her things, the kitchen she had graced and perfected and never allowed him to change. But it didn't slow him down. He ate half of what he cooked and went out to waste what was left of his life in the tract. The fields were a little, still a little heavy, so it had been even harder work than usual. So far this spring, he'd been plowing meticulously in the higher ground on the hill faces that the sun hit first. The farm was like that, always making rules for you, rules that took you away from the comfort of mathematical process. You couldn't just make a plant, corner field first, left to right, top to bottom, plow, amend, plant, feed, harvest. Instead, it was a mashup. This particular field first, as it was driest, but not all of it, just the higher slope that faced south, but that crop first. And it's not suitable for this field. It has to wait for the northern fields where the land camps down toward the river. Between the needs of the crops and the needs of the land, you can never get it right. It was always a loss. Each acre of beans or corn or peppers could be planted at the right time by moon and stars, or in the right soil by pH or sun exposure, or by crop rotation, but never all at once, always a compromise. The girl was inside his tractor when he got there. He climbed the seven rungs to the cab and unlocked, well, it should have been locked. She was slumped back in the seat. Her legs were fully extended in front but did not reach the pedals. She was still sleeping or pretending to sleep. Her short yellow cotton dress hiked far up her thighs. Her hair, a dandelion puff, shocked and moving in the breeze of the open cab door. Her mouth was open, kind of a purpley pink same color as her panties, which loudly screamed, look at me. Jacob licked his lips and swallowed. Lenore's thighs had been like crepe paper, softly wrinkled for years before she died. He hadn't remembered them looking so smooth and hard, not when he was awake, though he could now, faced with these. But Lenore had been pink and then freckled, even there. This girl was white as chalk, white and smooth as soap. Jacob started to wonder why she was there. He'd left it unlocked. The road was close by. He hadn't seen her before, but the country was crawling with hippies. It didn't matter why. He slipped his hands into his pockets and felt around. He was hard, 
the last thing he expected to feel again in life. His hands were so calloused it felt better through the soft cotton of his pockets. Standing in the door of the cab, he caught himself glancing at the iron shaft of the hydraulic lift. You could tie something to that shaft, hard. It wouldn't move if the tractor wasn't under power. It was trouble enough to move even when it was powered up. He was playing with himself now, staring down, imagining what he could do. This wasn't a thought he'd ever had before, and he knew he should shut it away. But it was so good to feel the rush of the hard flesh in his hands inside the stiff, protective house of his genes. He didn't think about the thinking. He wanted to see the girl's breasts, but they were well hidden under her blouse and the top of her little dress. He started to look around for a cord, a rope, something, but found he didn't want to take his eyes off her wet mouth, her white thighs, her pale maroon panties. Lenore's panties had all been white. If he could touch her, but she'd wake up. She sighed in her sleep and shifted, so one of her legs was bent, though they were still open, and he could see the two soft swells right through the cloth. At least he thought so. Jacob abruptly, abruptly jumped, a short jump, creaking like the bed, and she stirred. He stepped back hard into the door frame so that it clipped his head, and he drew out his hands from his pockets. She closed her legs and rolled her head forward, not yet opening her eyes. Jacob said, a little loud, Hey! She sat up fast and focused on him. What? She sounded sleepy yet. You're in my tractor. This was obvious. But stating the obvious seemed like the thing to do. She looked cold and hungry. Her nipples were showing, too, now, right through the dress. I wish she'd noticed them earlier. <laughs> <laughs> of course she'd be hungry. Ladies were always hungry. I, I'm going to Canada. My boyfriend's there. It was kind of cold outside. That was obvious, too. He was silent, watching her gather her wits. Maybe she was not too bright. I've been staying with some boys close to Woodstock, but we all got kicked out. Do you, can you tell me where I am? She put on a bright smile and tried to neaten her hair. Come on with me, he said. We'll get you a map and a meal. He climbed down from the cab. She followed awkwardly. Her dress was short, and she wore slippery sandals that were not made for the rungs of the ladder. He put his hands, hard, knobby hands, on her waist to lift her from the step, and then let the dress slip up as he set her on the earth so he could feel the sides of her breasts slide by. She tugged at the dress and prepared to follow him anywhere. He smiled to himself. Back at the farmhouse, he made a second breakfast of eggs and bacon and coffee, doing a better job this time. Eight strips of bacon in the, plant, in the pan, plenty of room for more. She treated the house as a curiosity, poking into drawers and cabinets, holding Lenore's aprons up to herself and putting them back unfolded. There was one she'd made from a feed sack with a bright yellow rooster on the front, and the girl held it up like a bonnet and crowed. She picked up the egg beater and clacked it in the air, spraying wet egg over the wooden counters and her own dress, laughing. Jacob wasn't laughing, wasn't even smiling, but he said, you'll need one of those aprons if you want to do that, and considered what he could get his hands on if he went over and tried to tie the apron on her. He picked up the one Lenore had used most, the one with the flowers. Those aprons had tough cords, thick white cotton twill tape. They'd hold hard if tied tight enough. The thought surprised him. He'd been holding his dark impulse away from himself as he took care of the breakfast. The girl was dancing around the kitchen now, acting a little drunk. She looked like she was pretending to be a musical. Jacob thought of how Lenore had been when she was happy, the way she would toss her head, or make that gesture like she was pushing the clouds back up into the sky, or talk back to the radio, cracking wise. He couldn't remember all the way back to when they had been in a musical together. Broadway before the crash was too far for his waking mind to reach. He remembered her gentleness though his own gentleness with her. He remembered her laugh. Lenore had not sat on the counters, ever, and this girl was jumping up and down off them. She seemed to be going out of her way to shake her little breasts around. 
She was digging through the high cabinets like Lenore when she wanted to find some particular old china plate. He pointed to a plate in the drainer, the one he'd used this morning, and she jumped to the floor and brought it. She held it out like a child with both hands. He put four strips of bacon and two eggs into it and took the toast off the rack in the oven below. That's lovely, she said, using words Lenore had used, but sounding fake, chalky in her different mouth. He looked at her white skin and tasted soap behind his teeth. You eat up. I'll find you a map, he said, and pulled out the paper's drawer to dig the county map. She was climbing on chairs again behind him, more like a monkey than a woman. He smelt the bacon grease and saw it pouring down on the papers before the pan hit him hard on the head. It spilled everywhere, grease and blood together, receding as he jumped up, or was it fell back? She hopped across from the chair to the table in front of him, a light movement like a goat, and brought the iron pan down again. He was gone. When he woke, the floor was creaking right under his head. It was loud in his ear, and the creaking kept on. He felt the heat and then pain flowing downwards. He knew he hadn't moved, so why was it making that sound? After a while, there came a rapping in the background, knuckles on glass, insistent, repeated, and then shattering. Tom Hull from the bookshop had broken a window to get in. He was clambering voice first over the sink. Jacob could hear the vases crashing off the sill as the man shoved them aside, and then Tom was by him, freeing his hands. His hands were tied behind his back. Jacob tried to move them, but his wrenched shoulders and Tom complained at exactly the same time, so he lay still and concentrated on the creaking and the heat and the red. He couldn't see much out of his right eye, but it might be closed. Tom had been talking non-stop since he came in, but only now did his words start to make sense. Jackie saw her driving your Ford cool as anything. She stopped for gas, and Jackie filled it and didn't say nothing, but then she drove off towards Stafford. She called Jim, well, Jackie did, I mean, and he lit out after the girl, and I come up to see what happened to you. Here, sit up, I'll help you. You know how he loves to use that siren. He pulled Jacob upright, or rather, together they managed to sit him up. He was a big man, it took two. Jacob was mostly focused on the pain, but then Tom used his kitchen phone to call for an ambulance. There was flour spilled across the floor, like the powdered rosin he'd seen in his dream. Bacon grease dripped into it from the table. Little footprints marked it back and forth. Who, boy, she cleaned you out, but good, Tom was chattering on, looking around the room walking as far as the phone tethered to the wall to come in. Each time he passed, he obscured more of her friends. Jacob thought of Jim's girl, Michelle, the nurse who rode around with the ambulance. She was 40 now, but she still looked good. He wanted to take a shower before she got there, but it was clear he couldn't stand, much less walk or bathe. He put his hand out to the side to steady himself, and it found the pile of cords by which he'd been bound sliced apart by Tom with the kitchen shears. They came up in shreds in his hand. The aprons lay unstrung, discarded on the floor. He smelled the meat from the pan, then saw it spilled across the table in front of him at eye level. Hungrier than he'd been in years, Jacob reached forward and pushed the bacon 